Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Barrett, and I uh, have been working with Reset over the last year, and I'm thrilled to have all of you join us today for this webinar. Um, we're really excited to be sharing with you uh, the roadmap to reduce U.S. food waste, which Reset put out uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, as a way to really guide stakeholders on opportunities and actions for reducing food waste in the United States. And we're looking forward to sharing some of the uh, insights and key takeaways from the roadmap with all of you today. Um, just in terms of a few housekeeping items, uh, we're aiming to share this information and present out for about uh, 40 minutes or so, and then um, look forward to taking questions from the group in terms of areas you're interested in learning more about or, or gathering more information. Um, so please, throughout this uh, webinar, we encourage you to go ahead and insert questions into the question box, uh, and we'll both try to answer them as we go along throughout the webinar, uh, and then uh, for those that we don't have a chance to hit on as we're going through the content, um, we'll look forward to answering hopefully at the end and, and getting through as many questions as possible. Um, following the webinar, we will share the slide deck out as well, um, so uh, look forward to, uh, to sending that to all of you and, and circulating that. Uh, so that you have access to the, the slides and, and the resources and, and all of this. Um, presenting with me today is my colleague Adam Ryan, who's with uh, Mission Point Partners, an impact investment firm, uh, which has been a key um, project coordinator and project lead with, uh, with Reset over the last year as we've been developing this out. Um, so I'll uh, share some high-level information and then uh, pass it off to Adam to share many of the, the key insights from the roadmap. Um, before we dive into the roadmap itself and, and some of the insights from it, I wanted to just share a little bit of background in terms of um, who Refed is and, and how we came to be. Um, so Refed is a nonprofit uh, collaboration that formed in 2015, uh, and it's over 30 businesses, nonprofits, foundation, and government leaders who are committed to reducing food waste in the United States. And Reset came about uh, a little over a year ago uh, from a, a few organizations getting together and really highlighting and understanding that while awareness on the issue of food waste has been increasing over the last several years uh, through great work from uh, organizations like the National Resources Defense Council, World Resources Institute, uh, Food Waste Production Alliance, and, and many, many others, uh, that there was still a gap between the level of awareness in the United States and then action for moving forward on a number of the solutions that were out there to reduce food waste. Um, and much like how other issue areas have used strategic roadmaps to guide action and activity moving forward, uh, Refed saw that there was a need to develop something similar for food waste specifically as a way to help provide uh, foundations and uh, investors and government leaders and businesses uh, and nonprofits in terms of of all of the different solutions that exist out there to reduce food waste. Uh, where are some of the biggest opportunities? Uh, what are the costs associated with actually implementing those solutions? And who are the stakeholders who need to be around uh, the table to actually get those solutions implemented? Um, so we were really excited on March 9th to release the Roadmap to Reduce U.S. Food Waste um, as this strategic guide for um, many different stakeholders to actually take action on this issue. Um, this definitely could not have been possible without a huge team of people around the table. Uh, so we said uh, this, this slide represents the range of different steering committee members, advisory council members, and then the um, the team who did the uh, analytics and insights behind the roadmap itself, uh, which included Deloitte Consulting and Resource Recycling Systems, um, as well as Mission Point Partners. Uh, and on the steering committee, uh, we were very thankful to have support from the Natural Resource Defense Council, Closed Loop Fund, uh, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, uh, the Fink Family Foundation, Ahern Family Foundation, and the Atticus Trust. Um, to really help guide the strategic direction of the roadmap, um, plus many other funders who came on board to support this as well. And this initiative really has been 
a collaborative one uh, where we've aimed to get perspectives and input from a huge range of stakeholders, many of whom are presented on this slide here, um, but many, many other interviews uh, and conversations and um, opportunities for gathering input occurred over the last year, uh, which all have gone into the roadmap that we've, um, that we've shared with all of you today and that we'll be sharing uh, moving forward as well. Um, so a huge, huge amount of thanks and gratitude to just all of the organizations who have been a part of this along the way. Um, and we're looking forward to, um, as Reese said, has launched this roadmap, um, continuing to uh, expand the umbrella of organizations that, that Refed works with as we uh, look to see how this roadmap can actually drive action on these solutions moving forward. Um, so with that, I will actually turn it over to my colleague, Adam, who will uh, share most of the, uh, the high-level key insights from the roadmap and uh, give everyone uh, a little bit of a, a better understanding of some of the things that we uncovered throughout this last year of, of research. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so for the next uh, 25 or 30 minutes, uh, we are going to walk through kind of the high-level insights and findings from the REFED roadmap. Um, most of these you will be able to find in the report itself, uh, which can be found at uh, www.refed.com. Uh, and the website itself is interactive as well. Uh, the research was broken out into three, sec uh, three sections, which we'll walk through right now. One is trying to build uh, a more uh, regional and fact-based uh, approach to estimating where the problem of food waste is occurring today. The second is building out uh, a list of solutions to help solve this problem and identifying the economic opportunities for each of those solutions. And finally, is building a multi-stakeholder action plan, identifying uh, the key levers that we can pull upon to help uh, work together to solve this uh, today. Um, based on these findings. As Sarah mentioned, the problem of food waste has been well publicized uh, over the past couple of years. Um, part of the roadmap, the team led by, led by uh, Deloitte and Resource Recycling Systems built out uh, one of the most comprehensive baselines to date of exactly where food waste is occurring geographically and along the value chain. And adding this up, uh, the, the research team estimates that uh, every year uh, consumers, businesses, and farms spend over $200 billion, roughly 1.3% of GDP, on food that is never eaten. Now that includes growing the food, transporting it, storing it, and disposing it in landfills. And here you can see one cause of this problem uh, on farms, which uh, is cosmetically imperfect produce, which oftentimes does not have a market today and is typically left on that farm to be tilled into the soil, um, a problem that, based on the roadmap, is, is much larger than I think has been uh, identified to date. Uh, this mass of food waste consumes roughly 20% of all U.S. cropland, fertilizer, freshwater, and landfill volume. Uh, to put that in perspective, if you took up all of the acreage of farmland that currently grows food that's never eaten, it would be the size roughly of three quarters of the state of California, roughly 80 million acres in size. Uh, and here in this photo, you can see it, uh, a site typically found uh, behind farms or grocery stores which is a mound of perfectly edible food that's discarded uh, for a number of reasons highlighted uh, in the research. Uh, another finding is that nearly 85% of all food waste occurs in either homes or consumer-facing businesses, which include restaurants, grocery stores, uh, food service, or institutional cafeterias. Uh, and this really highlights that to solve this problem, many of the solutions need to be targeted towards these stakeholders, uh, and consumers play a role in all of these. Um, and so what you'll find throughout the research is that uh, behavior change 
or incentives related to how consumers and businesses that serve consumers is a key part of the solution. Um, summing all this up, uh, prior to this research, estimates of annual food waste in the United States have ranged from 35 million tons a year all the way up to 103 million tons a year. Um, based on this county by county estimate and stakeholder by stakeholder estimate, the, the roadmap uh, estimates that nearly 63 million tons of food is wasted each year. Uh, and this includes a little over 52 million tons sent to landfills, as well as roughly 10 million tons of food left on farms that can be tilled into the soils. Um, other estimates have excluded these on-farm losses, uh, but part of this research um, want, wanted to highlight that this is uh, a very valuable source of loss um, that is still edible and has a higher use that should be sought today. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see the breakdown of where the food waste is occurring by stakeholder. Um, so nearly uh, 10 million tons on farms. Uh, food manufacturers and processors uh, has a much smaller amount of food that's wasted today, uh, 1 million tons. This underestimates what actually occurs, which is that nearly 20 million tons uh, of food is, is left over in, in the manufacturing process, but food, fan, food manufacturers already recover or recycle nearly 95% primarily for animal feed today. Um, cons consumer facing businesses and homes uh, both make up the, the, the largest part of that waste. Um, you can see nearly 85%. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see the estimate of the value of that loss. And you can see that by far the largest value is in homes. $144 billion, nearly two-thirds of the total. And this is driven by the fact that food increases in value as it moves through the supply chain. So uh, while you or I might pay 2 or $3 per pound for, uh, you know, in a grocery store for at retail prices for fruits or vegetables or meats, at the farm level or earlier in the supply chain, that's much cheaper before it's been processed and transported and stored. Now moving on uh, to the next section, we'll dive into the solutions and economic analysis. And as Sarah highlighted, uh, really encourage uh, folks to just type in questions as they go. And uh, if we can, we'll answer them. Uh, but if not, we'll address them all at the end of the presentation. This is the high-level takeaway uh, from the roadmap findings. So looking across 27 solutions that were analyzed, uh, the REFED team estimates that a total investment of $18 billion is needed over the next decade uh, in order to achieve a 20% reduction in food waste nationwide. Um, what was exciting about the finding is that uh, all of these solutions have either a break-even or significantly positive uh, societal economic value, which includes all of the cost-benefit analysis across government, consumers, businesses, and other stakeholders. Uh, and you can see that beyond this uh, over five to one uh, benefit per investment, uh, that there are a number of additional uh, benefits that occur um, on the right-hand column uh, from nearly 2 billion meals recovered for the hungry, um, uh, 1.6 trillion gallons of water conserved, primarily by reducing waste on farms, um, up to $2 billion of profit potential annually for businesses, 6 billion uh, dollars in potential consumer can savings each year, 18 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions reduced uh, each year, and finally, a uh, conservative estimate that this roadmap would generate roughly 15,000 new jobs. Uh, that $18 billion of investment is a big number, and so I think 
uh, it's important to put that in context. That's what's needed over the next um, five to 10 years. So it could be roughly $2 billion a year. And that's less than one-tenth of a, a penny for every pound of food waste uh, reduced or diverted from landfill. Um, the 27 solutions that were analyzed uh, break out into three categories. Uh, this is based on the EPA hierarchy of food waste reduction, uh, prevention, recovery, and recycling. So 12 solutions focused on preventing food waste, which is solutions that change behavior or otherwise stop waste from occurring in the first place. The second category of seven solutions focuses on food recovery, which is uh, whenever food businesses are able to donate food that's redistributed for through uh, hunger agencies or food uh, donation nonprofits in order to alleviate hunger. And finally, recycling is repurposing food scraps uh, that are typically no longer edible uh, into uh, energy or agricultural products, which made up eight solutions. Uh, and across those 27 solutions, the roadmap showed that over 13 million tons uh, can be reduced, can be reduced with uh, actions that are cost effective, feasible, uh, and uh, able to implement today under existing technology and existing policy. Here's a uh, list of the 27 solutions evaluated. Originally, we started with a list that was over 50 solutions that were brainstormed from that uh, wide-ranging advisory council that Sarah showed earlier. Uh, and we went on it down to 27 solutions that met the criteria where there is available data, uh, they're cost-effective, uh, feasible, and scalable. Um, and in the technical appendix on refed.com, you can find the list of other solutions that were not considered for the roadmap. And there's a recommendation that further research dive into the additional uh, food waste diversion that can occur by expanding the analysis to look at those solutions. The prevention solutions uh, fell into three categories. So first, there were a number of new types of packaging, new products, or uh, different portion sizing that is able to impact behavior or otherwise uh, avoid waste throughout the supply chain. Second is operational and supply chain efficiency, which are steps such as waste tracking and analytics or inventory management, um, things that uh, typically in that middle part of the supply chain uh, where distributors are moving food from the farm to retail businesses uh, and avoiding loss at that step. And finally, uh, consumer education, which is its own category uh, because it's one of the most cost-effective and scalable opportunities. And food recovery side, um, there's the seven solutions fell into two categories, which was donation infrastructure, which is either trucks, software, uh, processing facilities, or storage facilities that facilitate the donation of food from businesses to populations in need, uh, as well as donation policy, and, uh, such as tax incentives and uh, standardized regulation and education around liability. Finally, for recycling solutions, um, the three categories. First is energy and digestate, which it consists of anaerobic digestion facilities, either at centralized locations or water resource recovery facilities, also known as wastewater treatment plants. Second is on-site business processing solutions that can occur directly at food businesses to uh, re recycle um, food scraps at the source. And finally, uh, agricultural products, which uh, consists of composting or animal feed. Um, uh, the economic analysis uh, resulted in three main uh, uh, charts or sections, and so I'll walk through the three of these right now. 
First it is what we call the marginal food waste abatement cost curve, which definitely wins as the most complicated uh, slide in the report. Uh, you know, part of the inspiration for this is witnessing uh, in the uh, greenhouse gas and uh, energy world how this type of uh, abatement cost curve 10 years ago um, helped uh, a bunch of stakeholders agree to what solutions would be most cost effective to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, and we took a similar approach to the food waste problem. So just quickly spending a second here, um, the height of each, of each of the 27 solutions is represented by a bar. Um, the height of that bar is the economic value per ton. Uh, so that represents all of the economic benefits across stakeholders, such as business cost savings, consumer cost savings, or uh, other revenue opportunities, um, subtracted by all of the cost and investment needed to implement that solution per ton. Uh, the width of each bar across the x-axis represents the diversion potential and million tons per year uh, of uh, reducing food waste. So quickly you can see uh, some high-level takeaways which is that prevention and recovery solutions are clearly uh, significantly more cost-effective uh, and generating a strong economic value per ton uh, diverted, uh, while the recycling solutions are clearly the most scalable, particularly the three centralized solutions around composting and anaerobic digestion. Um, uh, the reason behind this is that most of the prevention and recovery solutions uh, require very low investment levels, um, such as software or marketing campaigns or packaging adjustments, while the value of the food that is uh, captured or costs that are saved are oftentimes uh, very high prices uh, at retail levels. Um, the recycling solutions, on the other hand, are much more scalable since they typically happen through large facilities that can move, uh, divert tens of thousands of, of tons per year for each facility. Um, but the uh, cost effectiveness is significantly lower because the economic value of food scraps is 25 to 50 times lower than the value of that food while it's still edible. Um, and on the ReFed website, there's an interactive version of this cost curve where you can see how 27 solutions uh, uh, ranks um, in the uh, different categories, not just economic value, but business value, environmental value, and social value. Um, so here we'll dive into just each of these three sections and some of the key insights from the roadmap. Uh, so as we highlighted, prevention solutions have uh, very low levels of investment and high value of the food that's prevented, which typically shows up as cost savings. In addition, one surprise finding was that the prevention solutions aggregated to have the largest net environmental benefit, um, beyond, even though they uh, added up to a much smaller scale than recycling solutions. And this really stems from the insight that by preventing um, food from being wasted, you're also preventing all of the upstream agricultural resources that go into that food from being uh, wasted. And those upstream resources, such as fertilizer and water and diesel fuel for transportation, uh, can be significantly higher than the downstream environmental impact uh, specifically made up by methane emissions once food scraps end up in landfill. Um, and the top three most scalable solutions uh, are also some of the most cost-effective uh, standardized date labeling, which is an exciting area that uh, the refed team uh, is, is looking forward to facilitating over the coming year, uh, consumer education campaigns, as well as waste tracking and analytics. On the recovery side, um, the key insight is that the food recovery system actually requires three core pillars 
to all be uh, move in concert in order to significantly increase the volume of food that is uh, donated and provided to needy populations. First is that uh, enabling policy must provide the right financial incentives that uh, incentivize businesses to make the effort to donate food in the first place. Uh, you know, we spoke with a number of businesses as part of the advisory council. All of them would love to donate more food, but typically donating food requires additional labor resources, transportation, and storage resources uh, beyond, above and beyond uh, putting food into the trash cans headed to landfill. And so any incentive, incentives that help defray those costs can be an important motivating driver. Second is education uh, around the liability of businesses regards to food handling practice, uh, uh, food safety handling. Uh, a key, one of the biggest fears of food businesses is that they will be generous in donating food and somehow down the line someone might get sick and they will get blamed either legally or in the public media. Um, there's already existing Good Samaritan legislation that helps protect against this. Uh, and the, what simply is missing is education. Um, and that's one of the, the, the recommended solutions. And finally, even once uh, businesses are donating additional food, you need the logistics and infrastructure that can store that food, keep particularly perishable foods like dairy, meats, fruits, and vegetables. They need to be kept cold. They need to be transported by truck and they need to have a uh, hunger nonprofit that can accept exactly that batch and provide it to uh, needy populations. And so this is uh, really a matching problem that occurs in each uh, municipality or each local region. Um, and so this is a type of solution that requires local action. Uh, and as you see at the bottom, the scalable solutions follow these three pillars primarily two large policy changes and uh, software that helps facilitate um, this logistics and infrastructure matching between food businesses and nonprofits. Finally, uh, recycling, uh, which perhaps our team spent the, did the deepest dive of all of the solution areas, yielded a number of insights. Uh, as you saw earlier, recycling uh, consists of nearly three quarters of the total uh, diversion potential to reduce food waste. Um, there's three main products, uh, compost, biogas, and animal feed, and stimulating uh, markets that can use this product and generate uh, attractive pricing is a really important key to stimulating this sector. Um, this regional analy analysis that happened uh, through for the top 50 municipal service areas yielded the insights that the Northeast, Northwest, and Midwest in today's pricing and today's constraints and policy show the highest economic value per ton from recycling overall. And that's driven by uh, typically current high tipping fees or disposal fees um, for which the recycling facilities get paid, as well as uh, generally high compost and energy prices uh, once those recycling facilities are selling their end uh, product. However, uh, this research identified that there are a number of levers that can really change the economics to help scale recycling both in those three regions highlighted above and really nationwide. Um, perhaps the, the biggest lever would be to increase landfill disposal costs, which would create a direct economic incentive um, that would help uh, increase the, the profit potential for recycling processing facilities. Uh, a second one would be to create efficiencies in the hauling and collection system. So here we're talking about uh, trucks that are picking up food scraps directly from homes or businesses and then transporting that to recycling facilities which makes up um, oftentimes up to two-thirds of the total system cost to implement a municipal recycling program. And one of the key levers to actually achieve that is by siting uh, composting or an uh, anaerobic digestion facilities 
closer to the urban center than landfills are sited, which reduces the miles that each uh, truck must travel to, tr to transport that waste, which can actually have a huge uh, impact on system costs. Uh, similarly, any ability to create denser routes for pickup of uh, food scraps um, can have uh, big impacts in reducing the uh, truck cost, depreciation cost, and driver labor cost, uh, and making these systems affordable for cities to implement. Um, centralized composting was by far the most scalable opportunity um, nationwide, while uh, both centralized and WERF anaerobic digestion facilities were also uh, a major um, driver of diversion potential. Um, the cost curve we showed earlier really looked at the societal level about what solutions are most kind of cost effective uh, if you're just thinking across all stakeholders. We also took a deep dive into the business profit potential, just looking at food businesses or private investors. Where are there opportunities that are ripe for market rate capital to invest in today? And this used you know, private, uh, you know, private costs of capital and took a conservative approach looking at where, where are we recommending that folks pay attention to opportunity? Uh, the, the takeaway was that in aggregate across 11 solutions where there was good data, uh, roughly $2 billion of, of annual profit potential is being left on the table today. Um, nearly half of that is waste tracking and analytics, which generally consists of commercial kitchens in restaurants or institutions or food service measuring exactly what's driving that waste through scales or cameras or other software at the inside the kitchen and then using those analytics to change behavior or change uh, uh, cooking behavior or purchasing behavior to have a feedback loop to uh, improve um, and manage costs over time. And you can see a number of the other uh, solutions also are directly relevant to restaurants and, and institutional food service such as smaller plates or trayless dining, which changes behavior in all-you-can-eat facilities, as well as uh, changing produce specifications to find a market for those uh, imperfect, oddly shaped, or cosmetically imperfect produce we showed earlier, which oftentimes also comes with uh, cost savings potential. Uh, the final analysis uh, on the economic analysis side looked at uh, um, environmental and social benefits. So this, here we looked at, you know, there was one challenge with the food waste area is, and one opportunity is that uh, aside from economic value and economic cost savings, there's these multiple secondary benefits that touch all types of different stakeholders. Um, so the first It's here the finding is that 1.6 trillion gallons of water would be conserved each year by implementing the roadmap, primarily by avoiding agricultural water use that currently goes into large amounts of food that's never eaten. Uh, and the estimate is that um, that 1.6 trillion gallons would conserve about 1.5% of all annual freshwater withdrawals. Um, given that the state of California is both facing a major drought and grows roughly 50% of all fruits, vegetables, and nuts in the country, we see this as an underlooked opportunity for uh, helping conserve water, particularly in the state 
of California and other key uh, agricultural regions. On the greenhouse gas emission side, the finding is roughly 18 million tons of potential uh, emissions that would be reduced. And this would come, as noted earlier, both from avoided agricultural and livestock impacts, as well as reduced methane impacts in landfills. The, uh, I think, key insight is probably the area with the largest opportunity is avoiding unnecessary livestock production or unnecessary meat waste, uh, which has uh, up to 10 times the environmental impact of other food waste. And so some solutions that particularly can touch upon meat waste may have a larger opportunity for folks who uh, have a particular interest in the environmental impacts. And finally, uh, there was a look at up to 15,000 jobs that would be created from implementing the roadmap. Uh, this, this is an area that needs further research. This is a conservative number, only looking at about a dozen of the solutions where there was some data to basis on. And this is primarily driven by job creation that consists by expanding the markets for compost. So this, you can imagine, is everything from transporting compost to marketing it to farmers or for environmental remediation, such as uh, in the stormwater market. Um, and this is, was, was the largest opportunity by far. Um, anaerobic digestion facilities, as well as the food donation, transportation, storage, and handling uh, um, sectors also had um, thousands of jobs that would be created from implementing the roadmap. Um, finally, uh, we're going to touch uh, upon a few slides looking at the path ahead and taking action. I think this is what really uh, got us excited, which is not just creating a static report, but laying out a roadmap that will help stakeholders work together towards taking action since all of the solutions are both feasible, cost-effective, and can be implemented with existing policy. Um, the four cross-cutting actions that were highlighted uh, are policy, financing, innovation, and education. And you can see the roughly dozen stakeholders that are somehow connected to each of these listed above. Um, you know, the takeaway from the roadmap is that these four actions are all needed to quickly cut the 20% of food waste that is feasible to reduce today and cost effective, and that this will put the U.S. on track to achieving a broader 50% food waste reduction goal by 2030. This 50% goal was announced last September by the USDA and EPA said, you know, kind of aligning the U.S. nationally with the uh, global sustainable development goal of cutting food waste globally by 50 percent. Uh, we look at the roadmap as highlighting kind of the lowest hanging fruit or the opportunities that are ready to take action on today, as well as laying out um, the additional research or additional solutions that can be analyzed to help get to that 50 percent. On the financing side, uh, we noted earlier that $18 billion is needed uh, to implement all 27 solutions, uh, which would yield an expected $100 billion of economic value. Uh, I think that number seems large, but when you break it down, it, it act, what's actually needed is much smaller. Um, much of the, the $6.6 .6 billion of private capital uh, will, will primarily come from uh, uh, you know, food businesses investing in internal solutions to reduce their own costs or boost revenues. And those will really flow as those solutions mature and become cost effective by market forces. Uh, the largest chunk of that $8 billion of government funding will come from uh, existing tax incentives from current legislation. Uh, one exciting uh, event was that during the course of this project, as part of the 2016 budget, uh, the tax incentives for food donations were expanded to a larger number of farms and food businesses and made permanent. So we are already seeing momentum and progress of some of these solutions being implemented 
real time as we're developing the research. Uh, the, the kind of key gap where the most action is needed is on philanthropic funding. Uh, very few foundations or impact investors are specifically targeting food waste today. Uh, and there's really a need for 100 to $200 million a year of incremental catalytic capital, which is either risk-taking grants, uh, equity investments in new startup companies, or low-cost uh, project finance to help overcome bottlenecks and get some uh, solutions or innovative companies off the ground. And there's uh, exciting progress of new impact investment funds being formed to help aggregate this capital and put it to work in an efficient way. Um, another real kind of big opportunity is highlighted on the bottom would be some of these social and environmental benefits listed earlier actually being uh, factored into government cost-benefit analyses. Uh, this $100 billion opportunity is not even uh, including the environmental or job creation benefits. Uh, and so the more we can include these into estimates, the, the better the case for additional funding for food waste will be. Um, on the policy side, there were really three near-term priorities. Uh, first two were highlighted earlier, which is to maintain and build upon these donation tax incentives, which form a core driver of businesses, uh, you know, increasing the amount of food they're making available for donation. The second is creating a common standard of practices for food uh, donation uh, uh, safe handling regulations. Here, you know, any national food business quickly becomes intimidated by the variety of approaches at the state and local level. And any standardization will have a major impact in sending a market signal that there's one standard process to follow from a national food business across the chain. And finally, uh, recycling best practices. This typically occurs at the municipal level. Um, and here, what we found is there's wide variation among each city in the permitting required for siting a recycling facility, their enforcement of existing waste bans, or their incent local incentives to encourage uh, diversion of waste from landfills. And, and there's a big opportunity to help all cities adopt these best practices. Um, recently, there's also been a number of uh, attempts at federal comprehensive national food waste legislation. Um, and this is a, a large opportunity that's identified that would send a real market signal. Um, and we're, we've already started to see some bills proposed today. And there's, there's definitely more opportunity there. Um, the third uh, lever for action is around innovation. I think this is an area that uh, putting together this chart around where innovators, both for-profit and non-profit, fall into the prevention, recovery, and recycling uh, categories was, was new work that, that Refed pushed forward. Um, we, I think we found a list of about 150 innovators that are already of looking for funding or putting solutions into the market today. Um, the, the real idea here that, that we're looking going forward is that some of the food uh, incubators or innovation networks, looking at highlighting cohorts of food waste solutions um, nationwide that can share best practices and help to be connected to food businesses. And there's five main areas that it seemed there's the most leverage where innovations could have the largest impact on helping improve cost effectiveness or scalability. Um, and that's packaging and labeling, such as smart labels or low-cost spoilage prevention packaging, um, IT-enabled transportation and storage. So this could be um, trucks that are actually learning real time and have software that help understand the risk of food being spoiled inside that truck. Uh, logistics software that helps more easily match um, the, 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 the food source from the food recipient. Value add compost products. So uh, I think most of us think of compost as an agricultural product in the organics and other sectors today. But there's a number of other new markets that could significantly increase the demand and pricing for compost. 
primarily around environmental remediation. And finally, uh, distributed recycling solutions. Uh, you know, the 90% of the opportunity highlighted in the roadmap was around centralized, very large recycling systems. But with innovation, we may be able to see a revolution around uh, home level or business level anaerobic digestion or composting systems, which with the right incentives could have uh, really take off, similar to how we've seen distributed solar systems uh, revolutionize the renewable energy market. Finally, uh, the last lever is education. Um, and so much of food waste happens at the very small scale from a, a family or an employee making a decision just around one plate or one tray. And that's why education is really going to be an important lever in helping solve this problem. Um, not only is it cost effective, but education at the consumer level also will spur demand for more retail offerings. As part of this research, a number of food businesses highlighted that they want to do things like standardized date labeling or spoilage prevention packaging, but they really need demand from consumers or a social license that this is going to be something attractive to consumers. Uh, one example would be uh, when you show up at a restaurant at uh, five minutes before closing time, is it normal to have the all-you-can-eat buffet fully stocked, even though most of that would go to waste? Or is the expectation that that buffet should have its last remnant so nothing is wasted? Uh, a really exciting uh, happening will launch in late April where NRDC and the Ad Council will launch the first widespread public service campaign promoting food waste awareness. Um, a similar campaign like this launched in the United Kingdom uh, in the UK a couple of years ago and had a, a lot of success in raising awareness and changing behaviors. And there's really a need to make food waste awareness at the scale of other public service campaigns like Smokey the Bear or Littering or Seatbelts. It's just that important of an issue. The other half of education is really around employees. Um, half the roadmap solutions require employee involvement and execution. Uh, and there will be a push for better training, as well as potentially a widespread certification campaign linked to food safety. So uh, I realize I've gone a little over my allotted time, but this is the last slide. Um, hopefully, you're all fired up uh, by the opportunity here, whether you're an investor, a foundation, a uh, entrepreneur, or a food business, um, or a government official. Um, we recommend, as a first step, you can reach out to us at info at refed.com. Um, if you are interested in taking action in one of these levers for action or one of the, around one of these solutions, uh, we also recommend you visit refed.com, where you can find uh, the interactive cost curve. Uh, the roadmap comes in the long version, which is a, a roughly 100 pages with a deep technical appendix, or a short five-page uh, a paper of key insights, which you can forward to key decision makers. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah to answer some of the questions that have come in along the way. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam, uh, for walking everyone through that. Um, so we've had a lot of questions come in. Um, we've been doing our best to try to answer um, some of them as we've been uh, as we've been going through uh, through everything, um, and we'll do our best to now get through kind of a series of additional questions. Um, it's possible we won't hit on all of them, and, and if not, we'll look forward to following up with, with those of you individually to, to try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so I think the first question I'll start with, and we got it asked a few different ways and by a few different people, um, was really around the opportunity for moving things further up the hierarchy. So some of the examples are, you know, on the manufacturing waste side, uh, we included in our baseline a very small amount of food waste that's going to landfill today, um, but much larger quantities of waste that are occurring there, although much of it's already being directed to animal feed or for composting or anaerobic digestion. Uh, and so the question was around what's the opportunity for moving some of that product that's currently going to animal feed um, but could be uh, edible and, uh, and uh, recovered either for human consumption or even have the waste prevented in the first place. 
Um, and so with, the, with this research and this work, um, we actually did not look at the opportunity for moving things further up the supply chain or further up the food hierarchy, but found that that's probably an area where there's going to be additional opportunities for weight prevention and reduction in the future, um, but that there is plenty of opportunity uh, just with looking at the hierarchy at the way it stands today. Um, and I know often a question that we have gotten asked is around um, if there's almost a conflict of interest between the different parts of the hierarchy, between prevention and recovery, you know, taking supply away from recycling, uh, or on the flip side, uh, building out infrastructure for recycling that then doesn't incentivize prevention and recovery. Um, and as we looked into this, uh, we found that there is so much opportunity that over the short term, uh, there's really not much of a concern for negative impacts on uh, different solutions uh, having, that different solutions will have negative impacts on one another, um, given the kind of level of opportunity that exists today in the market. Um, so that's something to be probably concerned about further down the line as we make more progress in reducing food waste in the United States. Um, another question that we got asked a few different ways was um, just questions on uh, including additional data sets and then also additional uh, potential solutions into the, the roadmap in the future. Um, and we uh, did our best in this, uh, in this effort to really try to look at solutions uh, for this initial go, um, go forward opportunity, solutions that we thought would be um, cost effective, feasible, um, and scalable, um, and also really concentrated uh, quite heavily on consumer facing businesses and the opportunities that they have there. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in the future to expand the solution set beyond the 27 solutions that we initially looked at. Um, I think we have a list of over 50 other opportunities that are captured in the technical appendix, um, as well as uh, new data sets that are coming out that would increase uh, even further the level of detail uh, and, and description on the, the parts of the supply chain where food is being wasted. Um, one thing I'll flag, we recognized that it was really difficult as we were going through and trying to catalog all of the different innovators and solutions and opportunities that are out there. And so on the website today, we have a number of resources available uh, that include additional case studies uh, and information on, um, on solutions that people can use. And we look forward to hopefully expanding that um, expanding that as a resource moving forward as well. Um, one of the other questions that came up a few different ways was uh, around the concern of lost profits across the supply chain um, and whether that's a risk for certain stakeholders not moving forward. Um, and so this was something that we definitely were very um, you know, very interested in, in looking into as we started digging into the, the roadmap. Um, and ultimately what we found uh, from all of the interviews that we did with, um, with different organizations and businesses in the, the food supply chain is that there's actually not much of a concern of lost profits, uh, and that's really not a key hurdle or stumbling block for moving forward on action on this issue. Um, and rather they felt like uh, in most cases, when if there's a risk of profits uh, being diminished in one product category, uh, they're likely to make that up as a, a basket shift in a you know new new or different products being purchased, uh, rather than losing those profits entirely. Um, so we found that uh, from the food business perspective, uh, the concern of lost profits really was not um, you know was not a challenge that needed to be overcome. Um, and that the, the challenges or the barriers relate much more to um, organizational capacity for addressing this issue, employee education, um, and then just the uh, initial awareness and understanding of even just the quantities of food that are being wasted within, within organizations. Um, one of the other questions we got is on, um, you know, was, does the $18 billion in 27 solutions for a 20% reduction suggests that the 50% goal is unattainable. And uh, we definitely are not suggesting that. And we actually think that um, if you look at the 27 solutions and then think about the four levers that go 
both around those solutions, and then that will enable um, more innovation, more education, uh, policies, and, um, and investment into this area, uh, that achieving that 50% goal uh, should be achievable and attainable. Um, just for the purposes of managing soap and process, we did focus on just those 27 solutions, but there are many, many other solutions um, that are out there and that exist today. Um, additionally, I think we see that um, when we think about things like innovation, uh, there are solutions that'll, that will likely be existing two years from now, three years from now, um, that none of us have uh, insight or uh, ability to really foresee what those solutions are going to be. Uh, and so that, that's where you'll see a lot of new opportunities to help drive that 50% reduction. Um, and so it'll be exciting to see how the levers, uh, the four levers that we looked at really can, um, by enabling those ecosystems, can actually help uh, to catalyze us towards the 50% goal in a way that we couldn't actually map out today, um, but feel confident will will really be able to, to be achieved. Um, there was a question around, um, there were a few questions around the, the uh, funding that we had really uh, highlighted in the funding needs. And, um, you know, where we see the money for investment coming from, especially um, specifically thinking about from a municipality perspective um, and state level perspective and, and budget cut issues. Um, and so this is where we tried to really look at uh, the range of different types of funding from the private to government to philanthropic. Um, and one of the opportunities that we really think uh, is uh, pretty significant on the government funding side uh, is additional research into the costs and benefits of these uh, solutions to really help um, highlight for governments the benefits of uh, implementing these solutions and supporting the funding of them um, due to the benefits that they'll see for their communities, whether it's in job creation, um, environmental benefits, or other social benefits. Um, and so there's a, an opportunity for further quantifying the non-financial impacts, which Adam touched on a little bit um, earlier on in the conversation, but by a better quantification of those impacts, um, we see that there's a lot of opportunity for actually helping to highlight this issue and the benefits that it can provide at the municipal and state level. Um, and so we're excited to see hopefully more action on that moving forward. Um, Uh, we also got a few questions on kind of the allocations of the different funding in terms of uh, how we decided that uh, prevention, recovery, and recycling solutions needed certain private, government, or philanthropic funding sources. Um, and the way we really looked at that is we were doing our best to estimate um, what we thought was the kind of key path forward for solutions. So, for instance, um, many of the business solutions are likely to be primarily funded by um, corporate budgets, uh, with a small portion of the funding potentially coming from um, catalytic funding from, uh, from governments or from foundations. Um, and then we, we also looked at how do the different types of government or different types of funding uh, support one another. And so in the technical appendix, we actually go into detail on um, kind of best estimates for each of the solutions and the different types of funding that are needed for it. Um, one thing I will say on this is it was based off of kind of best estimates of how um, opportunities present themselves today. And this is an area where we see there's um, likely to be shifts and changes. And we uh, tried to not be too prescriptive in this, recognizing that funding could come from a number of different types of buckets for all of these solutions, um, but did want to include estimates of um, what we thought was a likely and reasonable path forward. Um, and with that, I think I have tried to hammer through as many questions as possible, um, recognizing there are a number that we have not gotten to. Um, so we'll look forward to um, really following up with as many of you as possible to you know, continue to answer your questions, whether they're questions that are left in the chat box that we didn't get to today, um, or future questions that you might have as you think through some of this information a bit further and also have a chance to dig into the website and, and the roadmap itself. Um, and so look forward to, um, to connecting with all of you in the future um, as we really collectively move to, to drive action forward on this issue. 
Uh, thank you very much for your time and your participation. And have a good day, everyone.